The next hermeneutical category that we need to consider when looking at James 2, 14 to 26 is what we call a literary analysis or a literary approach. And literary approach involves a number of things. One of the things it involves is what kind of literature, the technical term is genre, that James belongs to. Remember that the Bible, even though it's one book, has many different kinds of writings or genres. There are historical books, there are political books, there are apocalyptic books, there are gospels, and there are letters, sometimes called epistles. And James belongs to that category of a letter or an epistle. And so if we want to understand James, we have to know something about letters and formulas that were typically used in letters in the ancient world, because James' audience would have been familiar with these formulas and expressions, and therefore we have to kind of educate ourselves so that we won't miss what the original audience would have heard and what the author clearly intended. But in addition to these literary devices which are unique to letters, there are also other literary devices that biblical writers use as well. For instance, inclusio. The inclusio is the repetition of a key word or phrase at the beginning or the end, acting as kind of bookmarks, marking out a section. That's not unique to letters, but it is found in letters and other forms of genre, and James may well use these and other kind of more broadly literary devices as well. Now, we use a lot of these literary clues to know where to start a passage and where to end a passage. It's very important that we begin where the author intends to begin and we end where the author intends the reader to stop. In other words, that this is a legitimate preaching or teaching unit, that this passage holds together. Now, when we do that for this passage, we actually discover that our passage doesn't begin at 2.14. We discover actually that our passage starts much earlier at 2-1. How do I know that? Well, because there are a number of verbal, thematic, and literary links connecting 2-1 to 13, along with our passage, to 14 to 26. And these links show that these two passages are closely connected together. Here are some of those uh, things that bind or link the two halves of chapter 2, namely 2, 1 to 13, with the second half, 2, 14 to 26. For instance, both open with the vocative, my brothers. This is a common epistolary device to introduce a new idea or thought. Both have the word faith as a key word in the opening verse. And be careful, for some reason, the NIV doesn't have that in that opening verse, but it is there in the Greek, and you might therefore miss how both passages, 2, 1 to 13 and 2, 14, begin with that key word, faith. Both passages deal in some way with poor people. Poor people are either in shabby clothes in the first part of the passage or who almost have no clothing at all in the second half of the passage. Both passages describe the discrimination or the neglect of the poor, and then they end it with a rhetorical question, right? Not a legitimate question, like a, a question where the speaker doesn't know the answer, but where he's asserting something. Both of those analogies or examples conclude in the same way. In the first passage in verse 4 and the second one in verse 16. Both passages in the first half of chapter 2 and the second half have the expression, you do well, kalos poieta. And both passages have the passive of the verb to be called. And so these are a variety of ways, verbally, thematically, and literarily, that the two halves of chapter 2 are closely connected together. So one scholar, for example, Ralph Martin, says this, we still have to consider how 2.14, 20 to 6, that's our passage, fits into the preceding section, namely 2.1 to 13. The links between the two paragraphs are too strong to be overlooked. These parallels argue for a smooth and connected flow in the author's writing, and the same situation in the back, lies in the background of the two units. So in other words... If I'm going to exegete and interpret 2, 14 to 26, I have to make sure that I see that passage in light of the preceding passage, 2, 1 to 13, with which it is closely connected and which shares the same background. The same point is made by yet another New Testament scholar, Luke Timothy Johnson. He says, 
The position taken here is that in chapter 2, James develops a single argument. You see, not all scholars see that, and so he's contrasting uh, these other positions with his own, that it's all one. In this sense, the final part of the discussion in 2.14 to 26 only provides the broadest formal framework for the specifics argued earlier in 2.1 to 13. Likewise, the point, the point of the discussion in 2.14 to 26 is not to be found by way of engagement with a Pauline position, but rather by the specific points argued in 2.1 to 13. If I might paraphrase what Luke Timothy Johnson is saying is, is this. He says, there's a close connection between our passage, 14 to 26, and the one before it. And when we look at 14 to 26, we shouldn't first run off to Paul. We shouldn't compare what James is saying first and foremost to Paul. We should compare it with the passage to which it's most closely connected, namely the verses in the preceding part of the chapter. So that's evidence for uh, the fact that actually the real beginning of the whole discussion of faith that works begins at the beginning of the chapter 2 verse 1. So does that mean that I'm wrong then to begin the passage at 2.14? And the answer is no, or at least not quite. And that's because there is evidence of a shift taking place at verse 14. So on one hand, there's a connection to what happens before, but there also clearly is a movement in James' argumentation. And what is the evidence for a slight shift starting here at 2.14? Well, it's one that we've uh, mentioned or looked at before, and that is the vocative brothers. Here said, my brothers. And this is an extremely common device used not just by James. You can see all the other places in the letter where he uses the same device. But in other letters of that day, not only the New Testament like Paul and, and uh, Peter and John, but also secular letters of that day to indicate either a major shift or a minor shift. In this case, it would be a somewhat minor shift within the whole discussion of chapter uh, 2. And then there's something that we Greek geeks or grammarians called a syndeton. That's just a fancy word for saying there isn't any kind of connecting word that shows the link between 2.14 and 26 and the one beforehand. Greek has lots of these little words that are actually quite important for showing the connection from one verse to another one. You can see some of them there, gar, for, or de, or all of these are more contrastive words, or chi, and. And so there isn't any of those connecting words in 2.14, which then what? Suggests that we have the start of something new here in 2.14. And then another pretty powerful evidence is the word pair that occurs in this passage. You know what a word pair is? Where you think of one word, you automatically think of the other word. So you have heaven and earth, or night and day. Those are all good word pairs. Well, in this passage, there is a clear word pair between faith and works, faith and works. In fact, it occurs 10 times. That's a huge amount within a relatively short amount of space. 10 times faith and works are held together as a word pair. And faith occurs in the preceding passage two times, but never the word pair faith and works. And also faith never occurs in the following passage. So you can see that 14 to 26 is set apart from the surrounding material. It's kind of marked out as an independent unit by this word pair, faith and works. And 10 times is pretty, uh, pretty persuasive evidence. It isn't a word pair that occurs just a couple. And maybe we're reading something into it. 10 times and nowhere else before afterwards is rather clear and decisive. Well, then, if we have evidence for at least a shift for a break at the beginning of 2.14, where do we know where the passage ends? And here the evidence is pretty strong. There's no real question. First of all, we observe that the word pair that we've already talked about, the last of the word pairs occurs in verse 26. And so that's one good literary or uh, lexical clue that the passage has come to a close. 3.1, we have again that vocative, which we noticed at the beginning of 2.14. So again, it's transition. It's starting a new topic. And then when we look at the subject matter of 3.1, 2, and following, we see that, wait a minute, faith and works isn't mentioned anymore. Instead, James is talking about the tongue and how powerful and dangerous and the need to control it is. 
So when you put all of this together, we have compelling evidence then that a legitimate unit of the Bible for preaching or teaching purposes then is chapter 2 of James beginning at verse 14 to 26. Now, uh, again, this may not seem so exciting to you, but I want you to see how important it nevertheless is for exegesis. So whatever passage you're looking at, make sure that you, or maybe if you're using a Bible commentary, this person has given some thought and care to, wait a minute, are we beginning at a legitimate point and are we ending at a legitimate point? That doesn't mean you can never preach or teach on a smaller part of the passage. But when we do that, we always have to be very much aware of how this smaller unit is indeed just a smaller unit and that it belongs to the larger unit and the boundaries that are clearly marked out. So I'm doing this more for illustrative purposes. This kind of questions hardly ever make it to a sermon or even to a class, but they nevertheless are an important part of exegesis. And they illustrate, again, how a literary approach, that is a concern not just for what the Bible says, but how it says it, is important. Well, that gives me a transition to talk about another way in which literary analysis is important. And that has to do with the internal structure of a given passage. James, just like Paul, as you may have seen in another one of our earlier videos, is a gifted writer who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit thinks very carefully, not just about what he's going to say, but how he's going to say it. Or to use some different vocabulary, James thinks not just about the what of the text, the content of the Bible, but the how of the text, the form in which that content is given. A modern analogy, maybe that is easier to understand, is that of a map quest. If we want to go somewhere, right, and especially if we don't know where we're going, well, it's not very smart to just kind of drive around and hope you finally found your way. You waste all kinds of time as you meander here and there, and there might be a dead end over there and, and so forth. Instead, we go on to map quest and we say, now, what is the clearest and easiest and maybe quickest way to get from point A to point B? And in a similar way, we need to ask, how does the biblical writer get from the beginning of his passage to the end of the passage? In our text, how does James get from the opening in verse 14, where he has those negative questions about a certain kind of faith, how does he get it to the end of the passage in verse 26? And this has to do then with the internal structure of the passage. I could say it differently. Instead of maybe just beginning at verse 14, that's what some preachers or teachers would do. They would start at 14 and go, da 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 They would explain verse 14. Then they'd go on to verse 15, and they go, da 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 and they would go on to verse 16. And you keep on going and going and going. I call this army exegesis. Why? Because you, as the interpreter, are marching verse by verse through the text. That's not a bad thing, because at least you're dealing with the text. But even though it's not a bad thing, it's not the best thing. Because you might, to use another expression in English, you might lose the forest for the trees. When you're so busy looking in a myopic way on verse 14, and then verse 15, and then verse 16, you may lose the big picture and the rather clear structure that the author has in mind, and that can be revealed in the text. And that is indeed the case, James, in our passage, clearly has thought about how he's going to address this business of faith and works. And we need to know what that structure is. Now, when you look at the text more carefully, at the variety of clues that are there, we can see that the passage falls into two major units. In the first half, James seems to be talking about what faith isn't. Or maybe I should say it this way, he seems to be talking about a false faith, a faith that is unable to save. And he gives two examples of what that kind of workless faith looks like, the kind of workless faith that he says is impossible to save. But then in verse 20, and there's another vocative there, another transitional marker, he clearly shifts gears and he has two positive examples. Two examples that come from the Old Testament, one involving Abraham, the other involving Rahab. And here he talks about a different kind of faith, a saving faith or a true faith, or you could call it a working faith. And then he wraps it up with a conclusion, a nice simile in the concluding verse of verse 26. Verse 26. 
If we would map it out, it, it might look something like this. So you can see there in the first box, he has the examples of what a non-saving faith looks like. He indicates the beginning with the vocative, my brothers, and then he has those two loaded rhetorical questions. What is the prophet? The answer is nothing. And is this faith able to save him? The answer is no. And then he follows up that assertion with two examples. Again, both of them negative. The first one involving uh, the kind of faith where a person just sees another Christian in need, a brother or sister poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and then just gives a pious cliche. And then a second example of the faith of the demons. And the first example is nicely and cleverly linked together by an inclusio. If you look at what good is it, that fixed expression we talked about earlier under the grammatical element, you can see that it's repeated in verse 16, marking the boundaries of this first example, and then followed by the application in verse 17. Well, when we get to the second half of the passage in verse 20, we get another vocative, right? Not my brothers, but oh foolish person, oh foolish man. So there's a transition here. And then he gives a disclosure formula. Now, if you know something about letters of the ancient world, a disclosure formula is a formula found in letters of that day that uses the verb to know. And it could be a statement like, we know this, or it could be a command, know that. Uh, sometimes it can be a question, do you know that, or do you wish to know that? But all of these formulas involving the key word to know, they occur at a transitional point. And again, that formula occurs at 20, and that's another clue that we're shifting gears, we're turning a corner, so to say, in a major way there in verse 20. Not just evocative, but also that transitional disclosure formula. And then once we turn the corner, we get then two positive examples. I guess balancing somewhat the two negative examples in the first half. The first positive example involves the faith of Abraham, and the second positive example involves the faith of Rahab. And then he wraps it up with a simile, right? A simile is just as this is the case, so also this is the case. And he uses the body-spirit connection to show that faith and works are so closely connected that it is wrong. Indeed, it is impossible to separate the two. If you separate body from spirit, it results in death. And so also faith and works results in death and something that is dead or useless. If you tweak this outline a little bit, this is a little more user-friendly outline, although it's largely the same. You can see the same basic strokes. It might look like this. This is our map quest. This is our this is our outline, our exegetical outline that we're going to use, our roadmap as we go through all of these verses so we don't lose the forest for the trees. We see again an introductory opening question, and his thesis is faith and works can't be separated. Anybody who says they have faith and it's not accompanied by works, well, that's worth nothing and it is dead. And he exemplifies that in two ways. First, in verses 15 to 17, with the person who's all talk and no action. And then in verse 19, with the demons who are all knowledge and no action. And then we switch gears in verse 20. Again, another opening question, a loaded question. But this time we see that the answers are positive. Remember, the answers to the questions of Abraham and Rahab expect the answer to be yes. And he picks, of course, two examples from the Old Testament. That makes sense. Because, of course, he's speaking to a Jewish audience who are well familiar with the story of Abraham and also the story of Rahab. And then again, he concludes with that simile that the two of them, that is faith and works, you can't separate the two from each other. That would be like separating body from spirit. If you do that, you result in something that is only dead. Well... That is uh, one important way in which we can see again how a literary approach to Scripture is important, forming the boundaries for the text, but also doing other important things, giving us the guidance for the outline or the structure of the text. And before we move on to the next principle, the historical, we'll take another break. And so I look forward to seeing you in just a minute as we seek to kind of go back in time and understand the historical context of this passage and how crucial that is for properly interpreting James 2, 14 to 26.